Good morning, everybody. The question we're gonna be answering today in the sermon is what is the real gospel? You know that there are fakes out there. Uh, It's so easy to fall for a fake. You know, uh, years ago, my very first ministry uh, assignment, I was a part-time youth pastor at a church in my home church while I was still in college. Sorry, not at my home church, but at a church in the area where I went to college. And, and I served as their part-time youth pastor. And the very first time they let me get up on stage and preach, um, I was up here. I was preaching a sermon very similar to this about what is, I think it was, who is the real Jesus? Would the real Jesus stand up? And right as I said that, I said, today we're going to talk about, we're going to ask the real Jesus to stand up. And I'm standing here at the pulpit preaching and then I appeared in the baptistry behind me. See, I'm a twin. <laughs> so, so it was actually my twin who was preaching. And so right when he said that, I got up in the baptistry. Nobody knew at the church that I was a twin. I kept that secret for this moment right here, for that moment. And it shocked everybody. And of course, they forgot all the rest of the sermon. That's all they could talk about. It's easy to fall for a fake. It's easy to fall for a gospel that's not really the gospel. In fact, in Galatians, we'll get to Acts in just a second, but in Galatians chapter one, Paul says this. Paul writes this to the church in Galatia. He says, I'm shocked that you are turning away so soon from God who called you to himself through the loving mercy of Christ. You're following a different way that pretends to be the gospel, the good news, but is not the good news at all. Gospel means good news. It literally means good news. So he says, you're falling for a different way that pretends to be the good news, but it's not the good news. You're being fooled by those who deliberately twist the truth concerning Christ. So what was happening in in the, this is in the early church still. This This is maybe 10, 20 years after what we're reading here in Acts chapter two. So soon, there was another gospel, there was a false gospel infiltrating the church. They were called the Judaizers. It was this group of people who called themselves Christians, but what they were trying to spread among the churches is that you had to become Jewish before you became Christian. And what Paul was doing when he was writing the letter to the Galatians, which was, a, was, to, it was a, like a circular to a bunch of churches in the region of Galatia, is he was saying to them, don't fall for the message of the Judaizers. You don't have to become Jewish before you become Christian. The Judaizers Judaizers were saying you've gotta get circumcised, you gotta do all these things that Jewish people do, you gotta follow all the Jewish rules and regulations, the Jewish food laws, all this stuff. If you wanna become Christian, you gotta become Jewish Jewish first. And basically Paul was saying that's not the real gospel. Don't fall for it, don't fall for it. It's a a version of what I call the, the works gospel. The works gospel teaches this, and it's still around today. The works gospel says, you have to do works, at least in part, you have to do works to be a Christian. In fact, next week we're gonna answer the question, do I have to be baptized to be saved? There are Christian churches today, to this day, there are Christian churches, quote unquote Christian churches, that would answer that question with a yes. They would say, yes, you have to be baptized to be saved. Come back next week, because we're gonna take a deep dive on that one to answer that for you today. Spoiler alert, the answer is no. You don't have to be baptized to be saved, but you should be baptized out of obedience. And we're gonna prove to you why that is, because that is one one of the prevalent forms of the works gospel out there today. There are other works gospels that, that, corrupt the truth. They're not the real gospel. This is what Paul's saying. It's not the real gospel. It's a fake gospel. Don't fall for it. There's some other fake gospels out there like the prosperity gospel. That's pretty popular in America today. The prosperity gospel. Maybe you've seen this. You've seen that. You know, the preachers on TV, they've always got the shiny white teeth and the flowing beautiful hair. And (laughs) if you've heard me say it once, you've heard me say it a thousand times. Don't fall for those guys with nice hair. They're not... (laughs) They're not godly, don't listen to them. I'm pretty sure Paul was bald. (laughs) Jesus, I know he had the flowing hair. We don't know that. We don't have real pictures of Jesus. I think Jesus was bald and beautiful also, but whatever. (laughs) But they get up there and they, here's what they say. They get up there and they say, God wants you to be healthy and wealthy. 
And what they're selling you is they're selling you the prosperity gospel. They're, they're selling you this false gospel that they're offering you something that won't satisfy and it won't save you. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but some of you, maybe you've fallen a little bit for the prosperity gospel. Another false gospel today, I, I think what, I, what we'd call today is the woke gospel, woke churches, the woke ideology, which... Uh, we were trying to summarize this as a pastoral team this week. Like, how would we summarize that? I guess, I guess if the prosperity gospel says God wants you to be healthy and wealthy, and by the way, if you're healthy and wealthy, it's from God, so you should praise him for it. The, the point is, though, that he doesn't guarantee it to you. That's not why you come to him. That's, that's the problem with the prosperity gospel. The woke gospel would teach that God wants you to be you, whoever you are whoever you want to define yourself to be, whatever gender you want to define for yourself, God wants you to be you. It's almost like the, the woke gospel says, you're God and he's just here to serve you. He, he wants to know what you want rather than what you're going to find out today is the real gospel says that he's God, he's on the throne, and what we do is we come to him and say, what do you want? How have you defined me? And that's how we see it. Young people, I want you to hear this. In schools, your influencers, people are selling you a lie, and it's in the form of wokeism. Don't fall for it. What the Bible offers is better. The real gospel is better. Just one more, and it's kind of relate. One more false gospel is kind of related to the to the to the works gospel, but it's the what Pastor John Swan calls the good person gospel. He he grew up in a church in a mainline church. I think it was a Lutheran church, and he went to church every week, and here's what he heard. And I wanna say this because I wanna make sure that we don't have anyone going to Alpine who only hears this. Here's what he heard. He heard that you just need to be a good person, that good people go to heaven. Now, I want everybody to just listen to me right now. I hope you haven't heard that at Alpine Church, growing up at Alpine Church. As he shared that, I kind of got some, some, a little fearful because I'm like, what if there are some young people who grew up at Alpine with that in mind, that they're not really paying attention, and so what they heard is basically the good person gospel, that you just, you just need to be a good person, and then you'll be saved. That's, that's akin to the works gospel. But I want you to know that that is, not, that is not what the real gospel is. I want you to pay attention to today's message because today we're gonna to look at the very first preaching of the gospel. It's in Acts chapter two. We're gonna look at the very first preaching of the gospel and we're gonna see the elements that Peter, who was the guy who gave the very first sermon in the, in the church age, we're gonna see what his elements are. We're gonna evaluate his message and we're gonna see what the elements are that he included. And I want you to pay attention to what he included and what he excluded. I want you to pay attention to what he didn't say as much as you pay attention to what he did say. So turn, if you have your Bibles or Bible apps, turn with me to Acts chapter two. Last week we saw part one of Peter's sermon. Part one was all about the Holy Spirit. Remember the Holy Spirit had fallen. If, you, if you're new with us today, we've been studying the book of Acts where at the end of chapter two, a couple weeks ago, the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost falls upon all the believers. They start speaking in other languages miraculously. Peter gets up, we talked about this last week, and he says, here's what's happening at this historic moment. The Holy Spirit is being poured out on all of us just like the Old Testament said would happen. And so he was a part of history that day, and he starts preaching this sermon. Part one of the sermon was all about what they were looking at and how the Holy Spirit was promised and, and why they were all speaking in tongues and all these different things. That was last week, part one. But then in part two of the sermon, which is what we're gonna look at today, he just talks all about Jesus. In part two of the sermon, he talks all about Jesus, and you know why? Because the gospel is all about Jesus. The gospel is all about Jesus. Acts chapter two, verse 22, it says this. People of Israel, listen. This is Peter speaking. God publicly endorsed Jesus, the Nazarene, by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. So what he's doing is he's saying, this whole thing, goes back to Jesus. You know, the false gospels always add something else to Jesus. The false, that's what they do. False gospels add something else to Jesus. So the works gospel, it's Jesus plus works. 
You need Jesus, but you also need some good works. You also need to get baptized, or, or you also need to get circumcised, or you also need to whatever. Like Jesus plus you fill in the blank. That's, that's the works gospel. And that's why Paul said this in Galatians 3, 2. He said, let me ask you one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. Here's what Paul is saying here. He, you know, receiving the Holy Spirit is shorthand for being saved. When a per, we talked about this last week. When a person gets saved, when a person trusts in Jesus for salvation, so Alana and Jacob, you just saw, when they trusted Jesus for salvation, the Bible said that something very special happened in that moment. Something historic for them happened. And that, that is that the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, took up residence in them. You know, before you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit influencing you. But once you become a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit indwelling you. And that's what happened at the moment of their salvation. For any of you here today who has placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit indwelling you. The Holy Spirit is in you. And that's what Paul is saying. He's saying, did you receive the Holy Spirit, otherwise known as getting saved, did you get saved because you obeyed the law of Moses? Or did you get saved because you believed the message you heard about Christ? And it's a rhetorical question, which means obviously you received the Holy Spirit because you believed the message. In other words, Paul is preaching in Galatians and in all of his letters, as is the entire Bible, it's preaching that we are saved by Jesus plus nothing, not Jesus plus works. Some of you might think that you're saved by coming to church. You're not. You're saved by placing your faith in Jesus Christ. Today at the end of the message, I'll give you an opportunity to do that if you've never done that before, to trust Jesus for salvation. Think about what the prosperity gospel adds to Jesus. They say Jesus plus stuff. They say Jesus plus what's in it for me. That you don't, you're not really coming to faith because you want Jesus. You're coming to faith because you want a better house than the other guy. You're not coming to faith because you want Jesus, you're coming to faith because you want a nicer car. And prosperity gospel preachers preach this unashamedly, and I think it grieves the heart of God. Benny Hinn himself said this, God will begin to prosper you for money always follows righteousness. Friends, that is a lie. Money didn't follow righteousness for Paul, Death followed righteousness for Paul and for all the apostles. Paul, Paul himself said this in Philippians 3 9, for God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death so that one way or another, I will have a better house. No, that's not what it says, is it? It says, so that one way or another, I'll experience the resurrection from the dead. The guarantee, the promise is that, I mean, really what Paul is saying here is I wanna suffer with him. That is the opposite of the prosperity gospel. Here's a guy that wanted God. He wanted Jesus and whatever that would bring. Friends, Jesus doesn't necessarily bring health and wealth. You might follow Jesus and then all of a sudden get sick. That happens. Because following Jesus isn't a promise that he's gonna give you health and wealth, even though those people with the nice hair say that on TV. Here's how John Piper explained this. I really like what he said in his book, Brothers, We Are Not Professionals. He says, in other words, to become a Christian in this way of seeing things, like the prosperity gospel way, is to have all the same desires you had as an unregenerate person, an unsaved person, only to get them from a new source, Jesus. It's like, that's what it's doing. It's trying to sell you. It's like, all the stuff you wanted, here's the problem. You tried to get money and wealth and health and fame. You tried to get it on your own. No, no, come to Jesus and he'll give it to you. That's not the real gospel. The real gospel doesn't make a promise like that. The real gospel promises other things. In fact, a lot of people here at our church have experienced that, that when they started following Jesus, they actually got rejected from their family. When they followed, started following Jesus, it meant more suffering. But they still followed Jesus because they received the real gospel. Or how about the woke gospel? The woke gospel preaches Jesus plus affirmation. That Jesus is just saying, who do you wanna to be today? What do you wanna to be today? And I, forget about how I made you. What do you want? 
How do you want to see yourself? Never mind that that confuses people. Never mind that that gives you shaky ground to stand on. Never mind that that depresses people not to have, not to trust that God made them how, they, how he made them on purpose. One woke gospel advocate said it like this. God created you and loves you just as you are. Your sexual orientation is not a sin and you are not broken. God's love for you is not contingent on you becoming someone else, but on embracing who you truly are. Friends, that is a false gospel. That sounds great, but it doesn't align with God's word. I, I'll be honest, I wish that were true because it sounds nicer for me to say, yes, that's true, come as you are. God doesn't have any requirements, just come as you are. He, like, he loves you just as you are and he wants you to stay just that way. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible makes it clear there is such a thing as sin and it doesn't, it doesn't give us room to, to come to him and say, hey, look, I'll come to you as long as you don't call this sin or as long as you don't call this sin. Now, I don't want you to feel like I'm picking on any particular person. I really don't. In fact, if you, if you want to debate this with me, come talk to me afterward or talk to your mentor or talk to one of the other pastors on staff. I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to just stir the waters unnecessarily. I'm just trying to speak the truth because, because the truth is what will set you free. And I think what the world is selling us is a false gospel. So all of these false gospels are untrue. So let's take a look at what Peter said was the true gospel, Acts chapter two. So, so we saw that it starts with Jesus and then verse 23 it says, that it requires the cross. Acts 2.23, God knew what would happen and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him. So here's what the real gospel requires. It requires the cross. How many of you love scary movies? Just a show of hands, raise your hands if you love scary movies. Raise, it's all right, God's okay with it. I mean, you can just be honest. He knows anyway. Good, there's only a couple of us that are raising their hands because you're all weird. Okay, you're all weird. No, I'm just kidding. But I, like some people love scary movies. Like I, I am not a fan of scary movies. I've got, I've got enough scary stuff in my life. I don't need a movie to scare me. Some people love it. So I had a hard time when I first watched The Passion of the Christ when it came out. Because I'm not, I'm not a fan of like gruesome movies and I knew it was gonna be gruesome. In fact, it was really hard for me to watch. But here's the thing. It's required by the gospel. The cross is required. I think for us, we like to kind of whitewash it. We like to simplify it. We like to minimize it. It was required because we're all sinners. Every one of us is a sinner. And Jesus had to die to absorb the wrath of God. Every time we see the gospel preached in the book of Acts, and it's gonna happen like six or seven times as we continue to study, every time we see the gospel preached, it focuses on Jesus and it talks about the cross. The cross is required. We have to deal with the cross because it shows us the ugliness of our sins. It's interesting because this verse, pay attention to this verse, it gives an answer to the question, who is behind the crucifixion? It answers in, in three ways. Number one, the lawless Gentiles, the Romans were behind it because crucifixion was a Roman form of death. The Jews didn't have the authority to crucify Jesus on their own. The Romans had to do it. And so number one, Paul, Peter is saying, the Romans did it. Number two, he's saying the Jews did it. He said, you crucified Jesus, the Jews did it. Now this is something that throughout history that people have used to stoke the fires of anti-Semitism. And that's not right, that's not appropriate. It's not anti-Semitic to say that, that Jews were a part of putting Jesus on the cross. Because what Peter is saying here is Jews were a part of it, but so were Gentiles. So what he's saying is y'all did it. We all did it, our sin put Jesus on the cross, but the coolest part of what he's saying is actually the real one who was behind the crucifixion was God himself, that this was God's plan all along. In fact, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, and I, I think Peter came to this revelation a little bit later, but I mean, he says it right here in his first sermon, and then he articulates it in his letter, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. He said, God chose Jesus as your ransom long before the world began. Think about that. Before the world began, God chose Jesus as the ransom for our sins. In other words, when, 
before he even spoke the world into existence, before he even created Adam and Eve, the crowning achievement of his creation, he knew what it would cost him, and still he did it. It was God's plan all along. So the gospel is all about Jesus. The gospel requires the cross. And then number three, the gospel is proven by the resurrection. Verse 24. But God released Jesus from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in its grip. Without the, without the resurrection, there is no gospel message. Some of you guys are super logical thinkers, and I, I feel you. I'm, I'm right there with you. Like very, I'm, uh, some of you are just very skeptical people. In fact, some of you might even be here today, and one of the biggest questions you have, one of the, maybe the, one of the biggest roadblocks you have before you will call yourself a Christian or become a Christian is it just doesn't make sense that a guy could be raised from the dead. And, I, and here's what I wanna say to you. I, I feel you. I totally get it. It doesn't make any logical sense. It's what the Bible calls a miracle. And here's what I wanna say to you. If you can't accept the resurrection, then you can't be saved. If you won't trust that, that what the Bible says and what Peter says in his very first sermon and what Peter says in all of his other sermons and what Paul preaches and what all of the early Christians preach, if you can't accept that, then you can't accept the real gospel because the gospel is proven by the resurrection and without the resurrection, there is no gospel. That's why Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 15. If Christ has not been raised, then all of our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. That's what Paul said. Paul said it makes no sense. The gospel makes no sense. The Bible makes no sense unless Jesus Christ has been raised, but he was raised and we can believe it. And then in the next few verses, and you can read these for yourself, but in the next few verses, Peter, Peter's gonna go on to prove the resurrection in two ways, and here's how he does it. Number one, he proves the resurrection by going back to the Old Testament and proving that it was prophesied in the Old Testament that the Messiah would raise from the dead. And he ends that argument in verse 31, and he says this. David was looking into the future and speaking of the Messiah's resurrection, he was saying that God would not leave him among the dead or allow his body to rot in the grave. So number one, what Peter's doing is, is he's proving to, remember it's a Jewish audience right now, so they, they trusted the Old Testament. And what Peter is saying is, look, we've all been reading the Old Testament, but we've all missed this. this was, it was in there all along. It was in there all along that the Messiah wasn't just gonna be some savior and some like Davidic figure, but the Messiah was actually going to be resurrected from the dead. And so Peter is arguing that from the Old Testament scriptures. But then the second thing he does to prove the resurrection is he just bears his own personal testimony about it. In verse 32, he says this, God raised Jesus from the dead and we are all witnesses of this. And this is good for us, by the way, for you Christians, if, if you're trying to share the gospel with someone in your life, maybe you're, you're trying to appeal to scriptures to share the gospel with them, and that's good, you should. But here's the thing with unregenerate people, the thing with people who don't trust in Jesus yet is they might not believe the scriptures. They, they, they might say, I don't know if I believe that. And so I love this, that Peter's modeling for us that we should also share our own personal story. Peter is saying, I witnessed it. I walked with him for 12 years. I saw it with my own eyes, the resurrected Christ. I saw it with my own eyes. And so Peter is telling his own story. And sometimes maybe people in your world, that's what they need to hear. They just need to hear what you've seen, how you've seen God work in your own life. Peter got to see the resurrection with his own eyes. Why do I believe that he really did? Well, look, the reason I believe that Peter and the other apostles really saw it is because before he died, they all scattered. And after he died, three days after he died, something happened because now they came back together and they were all willing to die for Jesus. Why were they willing to die for someone after the fact when they weren't willing to die for him before the cross? Well, it's because they saw the resurrected Christ. There's no doubt in my mind. If, for you logical thinkers, you, you explain to me why these guys all of a sudden would do an about faith, face and almost every one of them ended up being martyred for Jesus. They saw the resurrected Jesus. That's why we can believe in the resurrection. The message of the cross, 1 Corinthians 1.18, the message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. I love that. 
But we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. I know the resurrection makes no sense. I've got a math brain. I'm, that's just how I think. It makes no logical sense to me. That's why I have faith. I trust that it's true and it's changed my life. So, so the gospel is centered on Jesus. The gospel requires the cross. The gospel is proven in the resurrection. And then one more thing, the gospel declares that Jesus is Lord. So continue on in Peter's sermon, verse 33. So here's what he says at the end of the sermon. So he's, he died, he was raised from the dead. And then he says this, now he is exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven at God's right hand. And the Father, as he has promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out on us just as you see and hear today. So what Peter is basically saying here, and this is crazy. I know for us, if we grew up in the church, we read this, we're like, I've kind of read this before. I know these talking points, but just put yourself in the shoes of the Jewish people. What, he's, what Peter's saying to the Jewish people is, Jesus is exalted to the highest place in heaven. He's already on the throne in heaven. In other words, Peter is saying, he's already Lord. And he finishes his sermon in verse 36 with these words. He says, so let everyone in Israel know for certain that God made this Jesus whom you crucified to be both Lord and Messiah. Now, maybe you've never really thought about this in the context of Acts chapter two, but remember, everyone listening that day was Jewish. I think it was one thing for Peter to say that Jesus is Messiah. Because for a Jewish person, People always made claims like, this guy's Messiah, this guy's Messiah. Because remember, Messiah to them was an earthly figure who is gonna lead us, who is gonna kind of lead the people of Israel to freedom, to nationalistic freedom. So there are all kinds of people claiming to be Messiah. There are all kinds of ideas about the, who the Messiah would be. Kind of like we today as Christians have all kinds of, of ideas about who the Antichrist would be. The Jewish people had all these ideas about who the Messiah would be. So it's one thing for Peter to say, Jesus is Messiah. But he doesn't just say Jesus is Messiah. He says Jesus is Lord. Do you know what that meant? The word for Lord was the word that they had, the Jewish people had all over the place in the Old Testament. In fact, Peter had just quoted some stuff about David talking to the Lord. And what Peter's point is, is to say, that's Jesus. Jesus isn't just Messiah, Jesus is Lord. And so in Peter's first sermon, we see Peter declaring that the gospel needs to include that Jesus is God himself. He's not just a human being, but Jesus is God himself. And so when Peter said that Jesus is both Lord and Messiah, I think probably most of the Jews would have been like, what are you saying? That is sacrilegious. You could get stoned for that. But that was the message because that was the truth. And so that's why I think if we go back, I wanna finish with one more verse, if we go back to how Peter started, right before he started in on this whole Jesus part of his sermon, in Acts 2.21, we saw this at the end last week, that he says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What he's doing here is so it's like an inclusio here at the end. So he starts this whole section about Jesus and the gospel. He starts with this whole thing saying, if you call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. That was a, a quote from the Old Testament from the book of Joel. And now at the end in verse 36, he's telling us who he's talking about. Jesus is Lord. If you wanna be saved, you have to call on the name of Jesus because Jesus is God, Jesus is Lord, and Jesus is the only one who saves. And so the gospel always ends with an invitation. That's how I wanna end today, with an invitation. Some of you, again, some of you maybe have fallen for the prosperity gospel. Some of you maybe are struggling with the woke gospel. Maybe you've fallen with, for the woke gospel. Some of you maybe have fallen for the works gospel or for the good person gospel. Like, don't, I, don't I just need to be a good person? Is not good enough? I'm here, I'm here at church. No, the Bible says that the real gospel includes calling on the name of the Lord, recognizing that you need Jesus, and it's Jesus plus nothing that saves you. And today, I wanna just, we don't always do this here at Alpine, but I wanna do this today. I wanna, I wanna close with, with what we call a sinner's prayer. And there's, there's nothing magical about a sinner's prayer. There's nothing, there's nothing like 
in the words of a sinner prayer. Like you gotta get the words just right or it doesn't count. All a sinner's prayer is, is it's just a person who's, who hears a message like this and who says, okay, what do I need to do to call on the name of the Lord? A sinner's prayer is just you calling on the name of the Lord. A sinner's prayer just includes some basic elements like you're God, I'm not. A sinner's prayer says, I, I recognize you died on the cross. I recognize you rose from the dead. It just includes these elements. I recognize I'm a sinner. I recognize I'm broken, unlike the woke gospel and what it teaches. I recognize that, that you are the goal, that you are the aim. That's what a sinner's prayer is. And the Bible says that, that when you pray a prayer like that, the Bible says that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so belief is what saves you, not any of these other things. And I, and I wanna give you an opportunity today to do that at all of our campuses and right here at Riverdale. And so just if, if everybody would bow your heads and close your eyes, and, and if you're here today and you would say, you know what, I, I think maybe I've fallen for these other false gospels, and today I, today I want to turn to the real gospel, and I wanna call on the name of the Lord. If that's you today, then I encourage you just in your heart to pray a prayer like this with me. To say, Jesus, I recognize I am broken. I recognize I am a sinner. And today I wanna call on your name for salvation. Today I, I wanna trust in you alone for salvation. I believe that you died on the cross. I believe that you rose from the dead. I believe that you are Lord and Savior. And so today I receive the salvation that comes only from you. Today by faith I receive the forgiveness of sins. And I wanna say thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.